welcome everyone. Uh, to conceptualize uh, to the annual research conference. Community conceptualize a conference of definitions, perspectives, and approaches to communities. Um, today, this is our religion panel. Um, I, Maurice Hines, will be uh, presenting a paper uh, called The Rise of Muslim, Muslim, uh, Muslim America, uh, Stories in North Carolina, the Narratives from North Carolina. And then, um, uh, should we still look like this? Okay. Uh, then uh, Mr. Wasim Sully uh, will give a paper entitled Forgiveness and Reconciliation as Hope for Communities of Christian Perspectives. And then uh, Ms. Uh, Alex Thomas uh, will give a, a presentation entitled Gypsies of Egypt. Okay, so without further ado, um, well, I guess I'll just say that this panel is, is uh, set to go on until uh, 4.30. Uh, so we'll give maybe each of us about 20 minutes to present, and then um, we'll open it up for questions and answers at the end. Not used to paparazzi, so this is uh, <laughs> this is uh, kind of unnerving me. But, all right. So I, I guess I'll go first. Um, so my paper.
And then, um, in terms of after that, so after that, it seems that after uh, Muslim slaves that, that were brought to the Americas uh, sort of faded away, um, there's a sort of mysterious um, rise of Islam in the early uh, 20th century. Um, and this is in groups that some people groups that some people might consider uh, heterodox movements, such as the Moorish Science Temple, uh, the Nation of Islam, and so on, uh, and some other uh, groups that they, 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 they brought an uh, Islamic discourse uh, primarily to African American communities, uh, and primarily based in uh, northern cities like Detroit, uh, Chicago, and New York. Um, <coughs> And um, uh, often, oftentimes they they had um, certain perspectives. A lot of them they had a certain way of dress. They had a certain um, way of interpreting of Islamic symbols. And um, most importantly, they sort of addressed uh, the problems of uh, racial uh, inequality in a particular way. So I think the the most uh, popular example. Is uh, when the Nation of Islam uh, founder Elijah Muhammad he uh, uh, called all uh, white people devils and made that part of his sort of uh, uh, belief system. And of course, we know from that from that uh, era comes uh, Malcolm X. Uh, and Malcolm X uh, he had a very influential, influential role in uh, popularizing the Nation of Islam, but. Uh, in the last sort of uh, year or so of his life, he um, he sort of embraced the more orthodox form, and then uh, really sprouting from that, there are a lot of uh, not more orthodox movements, like uh, orthodox Islamic movements that come um, within the, the African American community, <coughs> and um, and those have uh, various um, um, various sex and movements uh, throughout uh, the late, the latter portion of the 20th century. And so my topic is particularly about uh, Islam um, in this particular community prior to uh, 1980. So 1980 kind of marks, marks a very um, uh, interesting turning point um, because it's about 15 years after the, the um, Civil Rights Act was passed, which um, as part of the, 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 the act was that immigration laws had changed. So no longer the people from the Arab world, from the Arab and Muslim world, um, as well as uh, other parts of Asia, uh, were they sort of banned from coming to the United States um, based on sort of the racial appearance. Um, <coughs> But it took almost about 15 years for more and more um, uh, immigrant groups to, to arrive in the United States. And then around 1980, um, there's a phenomenon in a lot of different um, urban areas around the US where there are these uh, urban uh, renewal projects and people uh, and the government started to uh, build um, highways uh, straight through black uh, or, or historically black communities in the United States. And this sort of shakes a lot of thing, things up. And so <clears throat> really the current state of, of Islam in America, as you all might hear in the media and things like that, is that uh, Islam is you know, some sort of a subversive thing in the United States or um, it's sort of this immigrant phenomenon. But really prior to 9 11 it was, I mean, not prior to, but prior to 1980, uh, it was primarily uh, African American. <clears throat> so in, in my project, I talk about, um, I, I have narratives from uh, the people who uh, initially established the North Carolina uh, Muslim community. This goes back to the 1950s, um, primarily with uh, a particular person and his family, uh, his name is uh, uh, Kenny Murray, or Kenny Muhammad. 
Um, and he's originally from Baltimore. He was a jazz musician. He was a sort of socialite. Uh, he worked, uh, you know, sort of in day labor. Um, and then a friend of his, uh, Joseph Blair, who later is known as uh, Lee Lee, was a personal friend of mine. Uh, he kind of introduces him to the Nation of Islam. And so uh, after that, uh, he, he embraces Islam. And since he's sort of a very um, a charismatic person, particularly in Baltimore, he, uh, he ends up bringing a lot of people uh, from the black community into the Nation of Islam. And um, uh, eventually, he gets the eye of one of the main uh, leaders or ministers uh, in Baltimore. And, and then he says, you know, why don't you go to my hometown of Durham, North Carolina, and, and spread the religion there? Um, and so uh, I haven't uh, been able to, to, to find evidence of that. But, but this, is, this might have been the first time that Islam had spread south of the Mason-Dixon line um, since the last slave, uh, uh, most, last Muslim slave who had perished in, um, in North Carolina. So um, uh, that needs a little bit more, more research. And so he goes to North Carolina, and um, he sends for his family a few years later. Um, but he ends up getting a, attracting a big following uh, within North Carolina, uh, particularly Durham, North Carolina. Uh, and he, he makes a lot of uh, friends. Uh, although you know it's probably struggle, uh, he you know uses his business skills, uh, some of his day labor skills, and really sort of building the community uh, with his hands. Uh, of course, with the help of the people that he brought into the religion. And so, um, so um, his community becomes. You know, part of the sort of social fabric of Durham, North Carolina at that time. During the 1960s and 1970s, uh, it was described North, uh, Durham, North Carolina had a, a black Wall Street that was, had a lot of successful um, uh, black millionaires and business people. Um, and, uh, but it's also known as a place where there are a lot of ideas. There are a lot of uh, colleges and universities in the area. And so um, there's a lot of different ideas. There's uh, pan-Africanism, there's uh, socialism. Uh, there's a lot of different ideas just floating around in the black community in Durham. And they're all sort of, you know, kind, kind of part of this uh, frequent debate. So some of the highlights from that community, uh, particularly in the beginning, um, that I have captured and I have yet to capture, I have to do with um, the people who have visited the area, such as Malcolm X, uh, Muhammad Ali, um, uh, William Abdul Jabbar, uh, or somebody, the uh, soul singer named Joe Tess. Um, and, um, and one of the interviews, one of the first interviews that I got was with the, uh, the widow of, um, of uh, King Muhammad, her name is uh, Margaret Muhammad. And uh, she actually recalls hosting Malcolm X in her home. Um, and here are some of the comments that he had to make about North Carolina. He said that North Carolina was one of the most racist places he had ever seen, which is something that is pretty significant because you know, Malcolm X had a lot of encounters with uh, racism. And so um, <clears throat> some of the things that, that I, I tried to really ask people uh, throughout the interviews uh, had to do with you know, this, act, this, this uh, activism that was taking place during the civil rights era and the black power movement. And also um, some of the, the religious or organizational philosophy, um, arts and culture, uh, so, so it was uh, connected with the jazz scene. Um, and then uh, adult and child education. And also um, just characteristics of North Carolina uh, prior to 1980. Uh, so, a lot of people gave me some very interesting an answers. And I apologize if I'm talking so much. Uh, um, just coming off of a code. So maybe I'm not the best person to, <laughs> to, uh, to read the session, but it's all right. So um, many of the, 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 the narratives that I got uh, 
of people that, that lived in this era. You know, they talked about the, the height of the community. Um, one, of the, one of the heights of the community was the building of uh, this mosque, which is uh, kind of in the downtown area. And um, uh, of course, this, this was um, mainly due to the efforts of uh, Kenny Muhammad, who, um, who used his, um, his connections within the Durham community to purchase the property, as well as uh, his, his background as, an, um, as a carpenter to actually uh, fix the place up. So this place used to be a nightclub. It was known for a lot of shootings, um, uh, fights, and things like that. The city closed the club down, and so uh, the Muslims, they bought the property, and, um, and they fixed it up. And uh, when, they, when they fixed it up, they had a grand opening, and um, it actually won, won an award from the city of Durham, uh, the beautification award, or something like that. Um, they said that you know, a structure like that, it had this arabesque structure. It had never been, uh, there had never been any sort of building in North Carolina uh, to that day that, that looked quite like that. And so um, um, he, or the, the community, they were able to sort of gain a lot of momentum from building that mosque. Uh, at, at one point, uh, one of the, uh, his uh, son-in-law described maybe like 15 uh, businesses that they had. Um, they had you know, a fish market, they had a school, um, they had a restaurant, they had a lot of different businesses um, in that area. And then, um, my friend um, uh, Yusuf Salim and uh, another friend of his, uh, Billy Stevens, who, who was a, a white person who uh, was actually, he actually wanted to consider himself a Baha'i. Uh, they used to call him Billy Baha'i. Uh, both of them opened up this uh, cultural center right across the street from the mosque called uh, Salam Cafe. And this is where um, Yusuf Salim, as a jazz musician, he would uh, mentor a lot of. Uh, in the area, and some people even credit him kind of single-handedly with bringing you know this whole jazz scene to uh, to Durham. So uh, Durham is kind of a hipster place. Uh, Durham, North Carolina, is kind of a hipster place, and I think this is this is kind of the the, the roots of a lot of uh, that sort of cultural ethic that um, that Durham is known for nowadays. <clears throat> and then just overall. Um, I get a sense that there was more of a community by uh, anyone who sort of uh, uh, who, who 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 was into jazz culture and things like that. They could go to that to that um, that community center. If they were if they were Muslims, they all went to that one mosque. Um, and then uh, generally, African Americans uh, in that community didn't have any problems, uh, you know, sort of relating with the Muslim community now. One of the, the, the things that um, that changed, um, I think some of the things that I mentioned before, building the highway through the, basically through the, the Black Wall Street of uh, Durham, that was something that was devastating. Um, but also within the, the community, there were a lot of things that, that were changing as well. So as you might know that the original leader of the Nation of Islam, Elijah Muhammad, who passed away in 1975, and his son took over, uh, or D. Muhammad, uh, or W. D. Muhammad, um, and he, he, he never really ascribed to the teachings of his father. And so, when he took over uh, the Nation of Islam, he made a lot of changes. Um, he sort of got rid of this sort of paramilitary, paramilitary uh, organization that OI got rid of the MGT, the uh, Muslim Girls Training for Women. Um, and then um, he dissolved a lot of the businesses that were associated with the community. And some people, you know, they didn't really like that. Uh, they thought that it was, um, uh, that he was just destroying the work of his father. Although the, the, the people that I interviewed to say that, um, you know, Really, you know, behind the scenes, the nation of Islam was already on the brink of uh, bankruptcy. Um, they were uh, under investigation by the, by the FBI. Uh, they were in debt to Libya. Um, so they had a lot of uh, issues within their community. So 
So one of the things that uh, WD Muhammad uh, did, uh, he, he, he just tried to make people uh, sort of more independent in terms of their business practices and not trying to associate it with the organization. <coughs> and then um, <coughs> later on, um, um, uh, well, actually at the same time, in, in the North Carolina community, uh, there are people who never ever really actually subscribe to the nation of Islam. Uh, there are the Muslims who are Muslim from uh, other sort of uh, uh, channels. And so um, the coming of the Iranian Revolution in 1979, um, uh, and these were already Muslims that were sort of, uh, sort of politically inspired. Uh, a lot of them were inspired by Malcolm, uh, Malcolm X, and they thought that um, uh, really the nation of Islam was to blame for uh, the, the murder of Malcolm X. And so there are already a lot of uh, uh, friction within the two communities. And then, um, so the, 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 the sort of orthodox Muslims in the North Carolina area, they, um, they sort of broke, broke off uh, from uh, the work of Muhammad uh, group and they created their own mosque, and this was, uh, I think, in 1981. There's a whole book about it, actually. Um, so um, I'll uh, wrap it up. One moment, so one of the things uh, that I wanted to do is actually get uh, lessons from this, uh, from the interviews that I'm, I'm collecting. So uh, before I left, uh, there was a um, community event uh, held in my honor um, before, before leaving, and this is where I sort of um, describe my progress uh, on, on the project, and uh, I tried to uh, Give them some things that, that, that they could um, they could take with them. Uh, so some basic lessons, therefore, um, were um, or recognizing the, the hard work and sacrifice of people. So uh, I think a lot of people um, they felt slighted within the community. Uh, I get that in a lot of the narratives. And so um, uh, I think this is one lesson that, that we should learn. And then. Um, the uh, second one would, would be uh, actually to allow people to do what they do best. And I think that was the that was one of the strong points of the initial uh, Muslim community. And then the third was uh, that uh, people work through their differences maturely. Um, we have examples of people doing that and not doing that from this narrative. And the last would be the importance of, of culture. Um, as sort of as a, as a cohesive thing to bring uh, to bring communities together. So uh, I'll save the rest for you know, questions and answers. Uh, and just, in, uh, just to kind of keep the, the, the process moving, I will um, allow Mr. Racine uh, to present his paper, uh, Forgiveness and Reconciliation as Hope for Communities, a Christian Perspective. So, starting off, what do I mean by community? 
So in the most basic sense, communities, a group of people that are united by some factor that they all share. So there are different kinds of communities. It could be a geographical community, so a group of people who live in the same place are considered a community, but it could be an ethical community, as we were here in, for example, the Muslim community, a Christian community. It could be a professional community, so it could be an engineering community, for example, or it could be an education community, you can think of the AC community, for example. But a deeper meaning of community, I think, if I think of it at least in a theological sense, so community can be a group of people who are sharing life in some way. And I want to say that they're not just sharing life, but they're sharing, they're sharing a certain kind of relationship. And I want to describe a little bit what I mean by a certain kind of relationship. This is a relationship that is marked by proximity, acceptance, and participation. So to explain these three words a little bit further, when I think about proximity, I'm thinking of it, uh, proximity to a degree that makes a certain kind of relationships possible. And I'll elaborate more on the kinds of relationships I have in mind in a minute. Uh, when I think about acceptance, I'm thinking about something akin to love and respect within, these, within this relationship. And one just side note about this, I have a, a little bit of a problem when talking about the concept of tolerance in this context. Um, tolerance um, seems to be uh, a word that indicates me thinking of something as bad, but me thinking of myself as good enough to be able to accept this bad thing and bear it. Um, I know it's not intended that way many times, but as a word I have some problems using it, and so I would want to use a word like respect much, much more. And this idea of acceptance uh, would be based on the belief that the value of a human being does not lie in what they believe, nor even in what they do, but in the fact that they're created in the image of God. So from a Christian perspective, I would want to say that every human being is valuable regardless of what they believe. Even if they contradict what I believe or what anybody else believes, your value is not in what you believe, and I even think that your value is not in what you do. Your value is in the fact that you are a human being. When I think about participation, which is the third aspect, I'm thinking of the capacity and willingness to influence and be influenced by each other. So I talked about proximity and acceptance and participation, and I think you have to have the three, you have to have the first two in order to get to the third. And so participation is the capacity and willingness to allow someone to influence my life and to influence, for me to be willing to influence someone else's life. Now, when I'm thinking of the kind of relationship that has these three, I would want to describe it as um, different than merely acting with goodness towards others, because a person can act with goodness towards others even in the absence of the kind of relationship in question. But the kind of relationship in question, a good relationship, is marked by depth or intimacy. The depth in question describes how much access and thereby influence the persons have in each other's lives. Different kinds of relationships have different depths that are appropriate to the nature of that relationship. In order for good relationships to develop, a person must be willing to have access and influence in another person's life and be willing to grant, to grant access and, and be influenced by the other. This can be described as how much of a person is in the other. Now this is a weird way of speaking, but um, one a theologian, a guy by the name of uh, Jürgen Moltmann, would describe uh, relationships as being in one another, as making space within oneself for the other, as uh, thinking of myself as myself in relation to the other person. And I think this is the beginning of a description of what true communion would look like. What do I mean by hope? So hope is not the same as wishing or wishful thinking. Uh, I think of hope as a justified awareness or belief that the future will be good. So it's not just wanting the future to be good, it is having reasons to believe that the future will be good. And I think it's this kind of hope that, for, for example, will empower a person to endure or persevere when things are not going well. The idea that we need hope in order to, to live, um, not just we need a, a wish that things are going to be good, but I think we need some basis upon which, some evidence upon which we can think and know that the future will be good. So I'm convinced that true human flourishing, which is a technical word, word, word from uh, virtue ethics, eudaimonia of human beings is found in such a community as described above. 
So in a Christian sense, I would want to say that the fulfillment of human existence is found in achieving such a community. And I base this on uh, the words of Jesus when he was asked by a number of different people, um, what is the greatest commandment? What is the most important thing that you would hold that humans have to do? And his answer was, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. And then he adds, on these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. So he sums up everything he would want to say, everything he thinks the law and the prophet have said, and the law here is probably referring to the Old Testament. He sums it all up in his understanding as to love God and to love your neighbor. This is found in Matthew chapter 22, verses 37 to 40. Now Jesus is here saying that the first and second commandment go together. He's also saying, he's also, he also seems to be saying that one cannot work without the other. In order to get a better understanding of what Jesus means here, I think we need to think a little bit more about what he means by love and what he means by neighbor. And luckily enough, we have um, a place in the Gospel of Luke where Jesus is asked about what this means. Who is my neighbor? After talking about the greatest commandment, um, he, the, a teacher of the law asks him, who is my neighbor? And Jesus answers by telling him a story that is very well known called the story of the Good Samaritan. And the story is basically about um, a man who was traveling from Jerusalem to Jericho, and on the road he gets attacked by bandits. He is left naked and beat up between life and death. Now, two men of religion pass him by, a priest and a Levite. They pass him by and they decide not to get out of their way to help him. And in their defense, um, if you can defend them in any way, um, it was dangerous to stop and help someone who was between life and death on a road where there are people who have been robbing. This is a common way to um, trap or to um, just kind of set up someone to get attacked. Um, also, probably coming from Jerusalem to Jericho, these two would have been through the purification rites um, and going to do work in another city. So to stop and touch someone who is bleeding, who is naked, and they might not know whether he's Jewish or not. So in their understanding, this might mean that they would have to go back and get purified again and not be able to do their religious duty. Now they pass him by and they don't help him, but then a Samaritan comes by. In the culture, a Samaritan is someone who is despised, who is not thought of highly. But the Samaritan decides to risk his life getting off his donkey and treating a man who is injured, putting him on his donkey, taking him to a Jewish town. Now, a Samaritan taking someone to a Jewish town who has been beaten up badly is probably putting himself in a dangerous position. And then give, taking him to the hotel and telling them, paying for his uh, treatment and telling them that I will come back for him. And then he asks, who, is, who was a neighbor to this man that was beaten up? Now, the teacher of the law wouldn't even say he was the Samaritan was, but he said the one who showed him mercy. And Jesus says, go and do likewise. Now, it seems out of the story that if I ask who is the neighbor that Jesus was thinking about, he was thinking the neighbor is anyone who crosses your path, is anyone in your circle of influence, is anyone you have the capacity to help. Now, the Samaritan is someone who does not share even ideologically what the Jewish person shared, but he was willing to risk his life for that person. And out of that comes an understanding and a definition that Jesus was probably trying to give of love. It seems that love in this context means to be vulnerable, to give yourself to another, to be willing to suffer for another. Now that is a very radical understanding of love. And this is maybe one of the reasons why I think acting with some goodness towards some people does not necessarily constitute what, at least in the Christian sense, we think of love. Moving on to my third question, what do I mean by forgiveness and reconciliation? So here I'm going to get uh, talk a little bit about some of my research on the topic of forgiveness. And what I mean by forgiveness is the dissolving of a bond that is created by certain kinds of actions, evil actions, selfish actions, that are destructive to relationships of the kind mentioned above. Now, one of the ideas that I using to explain what happens in forgiveness. It starts by trying to explain what happens when someone does something that ends up requiring forgiveness. 
So when someone treats someone badly, when someone does an evil action. So I think of it saying that an evil action creates a bond between the injurer and the injured. This bond gradually destroys other bonds that may have existed before the injury took place. It also destroys the potential bond of healthy relationship between people who have never known one another. Now the idea of bond I think is helpful here because um, we tend to think of when somebody does something wrong to someone that they break the relationship. And I think in one sense I can, I can understand why we think that. But it seems to me a, a better way of describing it is when, when someone does something evil to someone else, there is a connection that is created between them. Even if they never see each other again, they remain in some sort of way connected to one another because of this bond created by the evil action. Now this evil bond keeps people close to one another. This closeness is not necessarily geographical, but it is a relational closeness in some sense. The injured and the injurer can neither be separated from one another, nor can they separate, nor can they create or sustain other healthy bonds, unless this bond caused by the evil act is resolved. The bond can be observed in the injured as resentment against the injurer, and can be seen in the injurer as guilt. So these are ways to detect that the bond is there. The, the resentment that I have because someone hurt me, the anger that I have because someone hurt me, and then in the person, in the injurer, you'll see something akin to guilt. Um, okay. It is possible that one or both parties not be fully aware of the bond at all times. This does not mean that the bond does not exist. Forgiveness is the act and the process of dissolving this bond, which was created by the evil action. This involves the forswearing of resentment and getting rid of the guilt. Only then can there be a restoration of the relationship, i.e., the creating or reviving of previous bonds that existed or potentially existed between the injured and the injurer. Now when I think of forgiveness, I think of forgiveness is a word that describes the action the injured party takes to properly remove a bond between the injured and the injurer. This bond was created by the injurer through an action that has caused some kind of injury. The action of forgiveness aims at releasing both the injured and the injurer from the bond created by the evil action. However, it does seem possible for the injured party to release herself from the bond through forgiveness without the injurer being released. Now this is one of the challenging aspects. There are two persons that are involved, at a minimum. There might be more, and this is what we call a paradigmatic case of forgiveness. Um, one of the confusion that I found in the literature is that we call forgiveness as something that a, a victim can do, um, but at the same time, forgiveness in many cases means also reconciliation, which is something that involves the person who has injured as well. So one of the things I was trying to do is try to reconcile these two, two ideas together. So I argue that the injurer can only be released from the bond when the injured party has released herself. The release of the injured party from the bond is a necessary but not sufficient condition for the release of the injurer. This suggests that the injured is one that holds the power to bring about the necessary action for the release of both, both parties from the bond created by the evil action of the injurer. There are other necessary conditions that the injurer must fulfill in order for her to be released from the bond, thinking of something like um, penance or repentance in some sort. However, these conditions are not necessary for the injured to be able to release herself. In that way, the bond is asymmetrical. Therefore, the action taken by the injured party to release herself from the bond created by the evil action with the intention of also releasing the injurer is called forgiveness, even if the injurer does not fulfill the conditions necessary to be released. In this case, the injured would have forgiven, but the injurer would remain unforgiving. So there are two different states. If the action of forgiveness is taken by the injured and properly received by the injurer, this is called reconciliation. This explains why forgiveness sometimes describes reconciliation, while other times it describes only the release of the injured party of the bond created by the evil action. I believe the confusion is a result of the fact that forgiveness always aims at reconciliation, so forgiveness always aims at reconciliation, but does not always <coughs> attain it. Um, I don't need to mention, probably, that forgiveness is a very difficult and a very costly process. Um, sometimes when I deal with the topic philosophically and talk about it, people tend to think that forgiveness is something common and easy. I think that forgiveness always costs the forgiver. 
it is a very painful process that the forgiver has to go. One way to think about it is that it seems that in forgiveness, the injured decides to pay a price, decides to go a journey for something he has not done or she has not done. It is almost paying the price for the wrong person. And I think this is where it begins to link forgiveness with love. The idea of me going through a process that is extremely painful with the intention of reconciliation for someone who has actually hurt me, which in other words, some people think of as an enemy, is a very radical idea. So the Christian understanding of our problems is that we find ourselves in the position of the man who is beaten and needs to be rescued. For on our own, in the situation we find ourselves in, we cannot help ourselves. Now because forgiveness and reconciliation are such radical ideas, um, when Jesus was talking about the parable of the Good Samaritan, in one sense, the teacher of the law who was asking him, uh, Jesus was telling him, do like the Samaritan did and you will live. But I am assuming that the teacher of the law started to think that nobody actually loves that way. Very few people have the capacity to love in the way that the Samaritan is loved. And if that is what is necessary for me to live the good life, for me to have hope of having the eudaimonia that we were talking about, I, am, I find myself more in the position of the man who is beaten and needs someone to help them, I am between life and death, rather than finding myself in the position of the Samaritan who is finding someone who is injured. And I think this is the beginning of an understanding of the Christian idea of salvation. The idea of finding ourselves in a position where what would mean the good life, we are somehow finding very difficult, finding almost, we are finding ourselves almost unable to reach on our own. The idea is, this is the linking between the first and the second commandment, that we need to be reconciled to the relationship with God through which we will be restored to the kind of persons who are capable of such love, and thereby capable of the kind of community described above. Now let me end by saying this because I don't want to go beyond my time. This is not to say that without a restored relationship with God, we are totally incapable of acting lovingly or that people who are in such a relationship always act lovingly. It is to say that we find ourselves with a limited capacity to act lovingly, but that through a relationship with God, we are on a trajectory of becoming the kinds of people who have the capacity to act in such a way. Because we have been forgiven, because we have been loved in such a way as the Samaritan has loved, as the person who has made himself vulnerable in order to save someone who is between life and death, the Christian idea is that God has made himself vulnerable. God has put himself in harm's way in order to restore us so that being loved and being forgiven in such a way enables us to live in communities where we can forgive. And that is what sustains community, given the kinds of people we are who mess up most of the time and end up in situations where we have hurt or have been hurt. And then the necessity of forgiveness and reconciliation and hope for the kind of community we have been talking about. Thank you. Thank you, Lord, for that very powerful uh, presentation. Uh, now we will hear from uh, Ms. Alex uh, Mark.
initially come from India, mm -hmm. and they were thought to come from Egypt, hence the name Gypsy Egypt. Yes. Yeah, but in fact they are all over, all over, all over Europe, all over here, all over everywhere. Okay. Is okay. that right? Yes, yes. You know more than most people. Yeah. Excellent. <laughs> yeah. And they do not necessarily come to a nation state, which is why you get the name Roma, in their Roman. Yes. Uh, census, 
like in the U.S., you know, the, all those races and ethnicities in, in the U.S. census. It's not the case in Egypt. So it's very hard to have a good idea of how many um, uh, Chava or Dom we have. Just one point on religion, uh, because that's what in Egypt allows people to categorize uh, who you are. Uh, most of the Khadr and the Dom are Muslim, so don't, they don't qualify to be a minority. I know it's a contested term, but uh, so they are very sort of invisible. Now, where are they? Um, they are to be found, they used to be in Upper Egypt mostly, uh, and then a lot of them migrated. Um, and I've been trying to see some differences between the perceptions and similarities in Europe and yet. So, um, in Europe, uh, the Gypsy or the Roma are well known. Okay, when you think, when, and why are they well known? People know them, and usually the image is a very negative image. So it's this other that cannot, they are nomads, most of them are not nomads. Uh, but the other that cannot be integrated, the other that is so different, that is sort of a pariah. Or they dance really well, and they do good music, and the women are beautiful, and so forth. But they are, they are very much orientalized uh, within the context of, of Europe. Um, and here it's a little bit different. So I tried to research, first of all, what people were saying and, and what the media was saying about them. And when they were in Upper Egypt, they were mostly considered as yet another tribe. And in a more tribal environment, they made sense. So no one really saw them as the Khagar or the Dawar, the Halabi. They were a tribe with specific occupation. And their occupations would be fortune-telling, uh, folk medicine, so sort of like, you know, with, with different herbs and, and magic potions. Uh, they were also uh, working with horses and, and donkeys and making little arts and crafts. So that's what they would be famous for. And obviously they would also be famous for being thieves. Uh, there is this very strong stigma uh, on, on uh, this group of people. Now, where are they coming from? Again, if you look at Europe, most people would say, well, the Roma, um, some people would say they're going from Romania. Uh, and that's a blatant mistake. But of, of course, there's a lot of Roma in Romania, but they're coming from India. And I think it's, it's a well accepted uh, thing. Um, and how did we find out that they come from uh, India? It was linguists who found out about it, because when they studied the Romani language, it was very close to Sanskrit. Now, the Dom, they speak the Domari language, which is very close to Romani, uh, and also uh, rather close and to Sanskrit. But most people in Egypt, and that's I, I did a media you know, analysis and sort of a little bit of a, of a review, would not really associate uh, the Khagar with India. But there's more of all kinds of legends. So people would say, oh, well, they were um, one of the lost Jewish tribe, or they were Copt, or they were Romans, or they're coming from Nubia, or they are Berbers, or they so they're pretty much coming from everywhere, but not from here. And it's always the same idea. They are the other, sort of like the essence of the other. Um, and then they don't really have a language. So here people uh, who belong to these groups uh, don't really speak to marry anymore, while in other areas, like other countries of the Middle East, they, they do. But here it's, it's not really uh, the case. So I have um, interviewed, um, it was very hard to find them, but uh, I have managed to interview a couple of Khabar. Uh, to give you an example, now mostly a lot of them have left Upper Egypt to come to Cairo, and a lot of them live in the city of the dead. Uh, and they live in very impoverished uh, areas. There's an area called Khosh al Khadar in Cairo, uh, where uh, you also uh, can find them. You can find them in Alexandria, you can find them in Tenta, so in many uh, different cities. Uh, but they, they are very impoverished. Um, and so uh, when I talk to them, uh, and ask them what they thought about where they were coming from. Uh, it seemed very often that they, they didn't know. Uh, they knew that there was something mysterious and secret about their roots, but that's often what you say when you don't know, but you want to sort of, you know, if you think about what Weber is saying, you want to give some prestige to your group. When you're negatively uh, stereotype, um, stigmatized, you want to sort of like look uh, a little bit, bit better. So, so they have no, uh, no clear idea. Now, um, when I did all my, my research, what I came to find is this um, idea of fragments. And that we know fragments of the Hagar, and Hagar interacts in fragments 
with uh, Egyptians. Now, if you're Egyptians, have you ever interacted with the Haggah? Uh, did you know the term Haggah? I'm, I'm butchering it, I'm sorry. Who did know, who, aside from you, who knew the term? Who had heard that term before? I heard it, but I didn't know that, was, that, that it meant gypsies. What did you think it mean? It was just a very negatively stereotyped. Sort of like a thug or sort yeah, of like a. Like just a group. A group of like. I don't associate that with Jesus. Okay, okay. It's usually used as a. Yeah. As it's a also a very negative term, yeah, right? It's, yeah, it's, it's not said, a compliment. You said it's an insult and to me, I'm um, uncouth, unbehaved. Yes, okay. No morals. No morals, so yeah. sort of like criminal a little right. bit. Yeah, yeah. How about you? Uh, I've, I've known it. What kind of story? Good stories or bad stories? She just told me about how like, uh, they exist in Egypt. But I guess there was uh, a, a series called Roish. It was about uh, gypsies and stuff like that. So I used to know. Okay. Okay. So yeah, so people know fragments. That's why I'm interested in, in this idea. And, and we always think of an identity as something rigid and essentialized. And it's really hard to essentialize them. First, we shouldn't essentialize identities. But the other thing is because we just know little pieces. Um, and um, now, despite them being known uh, by fragments like that, uh, there are nonetheless some boundaries that are constructed around them. And it seems like they never belong. So I conducted a lot of interviews with uh, non Hagar uh, uh, Egyptians. And very often, it's like they, are, they never quite fit. And this notion of boundaries that you create around a group is to make a group other. You know, you're not, it's us and it's them, and there is this boundary that cannot be crossed. So I told you they were Muslim, um, but when I interviewed uh, people, I said, well, they are Muslim, but they are not good Muslim. Uh, because they can't be good Muslim because they are criminals. So, and they don't pray right, like us. Uh, and they, they are dirty and they don't wash before they pray. So, so, so they are Muslim, but they still don't belong to this sort of community uh, that uh, religion uh, could create. Um, there is also a lot of like cultural differences, and it's, it's made by saying, okay, they're Egyptian, uh, but culturally they're different from us. You know, they have no moral, they're criminal, they're kidnappings. And I was asking what your mother was talking about, because some people would say, oh, my parents would tell me, be careful, you're going to be kidnapped by your father. Uh, and they'll take you away. And it's very interesting because I'm European, and that's also the stories that Europeans a long time ago would say, oh no, the gypsies are going to take you, and, and then that's it. So come home, uh, you know, not too late, because otherwise it's dangerous. So it's this sort of like the dangerous other. Um, there is also this sort of like racialization, uh, and, and most of them, um, you know, very, it's, it's, it's very hard to identify a Hagar. Uh, because physically, they don't look different from other Egyptians. Uh, but people have talked with me, oh no, 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 they're different, it's their eyes. They have those mean eyes, these the eyes are really dark, you see the evil eye, and they get the evil eyes. So there is all these like, stories uh, that are just showing how much those boundaries are being uh, created. Last thing is the language. So uh, I told you that um, there's this Domeri language that is being studied uh, in and Palestine and also in Syria and in Iraq. Uh, and, and some people have seen uh, similarities with uh, Romani and Romani, but not here, because they do not really uh, speak it anymore. But there is a language that I've heard about called the Sim. So this language is like a code uh, that they are supposed to be uh, speaking together, but it's just a few words. And all the Hadar I met, uh, they only knew like a couple of words of Sim. Uh, and and not, it's not a true language, but it's more a way to sort of like create some, you know, proximity because we have a shared language, although there is not a real um, a language. Um, and then occupational, obviously, uh, they are very much put in the categories of the occupations they have, uh, which would be, um, again, you know, fortune tellers. Have you ever seen fortune tellers in Cairo? Most of them are Hagar. If you go to the zoo in the morning, I've been there many times, uh, and they would come and they would like tell the future and they all do the same thing. They have like little uh, bracelets made of shell and they all have a very interesting ritual. They all do exactly the same thing. And so I asked them, are you Hagar? They're like, no, 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 what are you talking about? And I was like, okay, really? Because I've heard of Hagar all the best. But like, well, yes, we are Hagar. So, you know, it's like, you wonder how much there is this desirability. Um, but, but they are there. And obviously, um, criminals. Now, 
Um, what I've looked at is, um, I don't know how I'm doing on time, but I'll try to go a little bit faster, is that what has interested me in this presentation has been the representation of this uh, Hagar. Um, and again, they've always been described, and it's the same with the gypsies and the Roma, they're always described by the others. There's always the outsiders who is describing them. And so, um, it's like the sort of like Orientalist representation, and as you know, the Orientalist would describe the Orient, uh, but also create an identity. And, and some uh, researchers have said that actually the gypsies uh, have been Orientalized within Europe. Interestingly enough, you know who were the first one to talk about the, the Hagar and the dog in Egypt? Orientalists coming from Europe in the 19th century. So they saw them, they're like, oh, they're just like our Roma, uh, or our gypsies, and they sort of like, identified. So I came to actually question, do, do they really exist? Or are they just like this sort of like construct? So anyway, um, there is another figure that is uh, largely associated with the uh, Hagar, it's the Hawazi. Have you heard of the Hawazi? Yeah, so what are the Hawazi? Hawazi is the much more dense, exactly. It's a belly dancer. Okay? So the Hawazi is a belly dancer, uh, and the idea would be that a lot of these Hawazi uh, are another yet type of Hagar uh, tribe, and they belong to those tribes. People don't all agree. But, so there is this fantasy of the beautiful belly dancer, uh, and very similar to the European representation of Carmen. You know, and there's a lot of, so it's the woman is uh, fantastic and, and so forth. And now in Europe, what has happened in the representation of the Roma is they went from being this sort of oriental fantasy to being criminals and beggars. So it's, it's the same thing uh, has happened in Egypt. And, and again, uh, you know, this is what happened in Europe. So there's all these like beautiful, sexualized, orientalized, you know, the female that all like, white males are dreaming of possessing and it's sort of like fantasy. Um, same thing here. And so here are some movies, and I looked at all the movies on Hagar, and Tamar Hena was one of the first movies, maybe you've seen it, and she's a Hawazi, and she's a Hagar, and she is, um, you know, there's a whole story um, of, of her being in a tribe, and she might be saved by someone, but in the end she goes back to the tribe. Uh, and so there's Hagaria, and there's all kinds of movies about always, and it's always the beautiful woman and then the Egyptian guy. There's never like a uh, Hagar man and an Egyptian woman. That doesn't happen. But the last movie is called Prison of Women. Have you seen that? Yes. So there's, um, it was a Ramadan uh, a series, right? And about Prison of Women. And one of the characters was a Hagar, a woman. And she was in jail. And I've watched parts of it. And this woman is really interesting in the movie because she's portrayed as she is like stealing things and then she goes home and she starts smoking a cigarette and yelling at her husband and the husband is like lighting the cigarette for her and saying, oh please, please, please. So like the idea is this, this very strong, very stereotyped uh, matriarch of Egypt. So uh, just to summarize, because I have probably uh, two minutes left, um, the, just my sort of concluding thoughts are we don't really know who the Hagar or the Gypsies or the Roma are, uh, but they have come to have this identity of the other, uh, this identity of the one who never belongs, and it's very interesting that this identity is created similarly in Egypt and in Europe. So Egyptians and Europeans are protected on that Hagar, their fears and their torment, and sometimes it can be the beautiful woman, you know, that is exotic and exciting, or it can be the scary criminal. So all these sort of like projection and representations are very similar. The media discourse obviously uh, doesn't help, and I did an um, analysis of what was being said about now the Hagar and it's really their thugs and their criminals. Uh, and they have this also uh, matriarchal feature uh, that has been highlighted in the media. So again, the criminals, it's the women. They are the ones who are stealing. They are the ones who are the beggars. They are the ones who are doing fortune telling and then they take your money. And my sort of read on that um, is that I have talked about Hagar. They are not really matriarchal, I mean, by any means. But in the Egyptian representation, a matriarchal society means that women are very powerful and it's not necessarily a good thing, it's an emasculation of the males. So it's more to create yet another boundary than to have like, oh wow, they are so emancipated and feminist. 
And I think it's just to say, look how different they are from us. Uh, and it's um, like this. So conclusion, um, I hope I stirred a little bit of interest in this group. Uh, they are very hard to understand. And the last thing I would like to do, I've just written a book about them, um, is to essentialize them and to make them this object, because that's not the point. Uh, in, in social anthropology, uh, but I think it's interesting, interesting to look at these fragments, at, at this representation, and uh, these uh, uh, negotiations between how they are represented and who they are. Thank you. First and foremost, I want to say I enjoy each and every one of your presentations. And I, as I was tweeting and taking pictures, I saw an interconnection uh, among all of them. And uh, just like I, I have some other questions, but I'll share with the rest of the audience. And I'll start with one, and then later on, as other people have to answer their questions, I'll ask my question. So I'll start off with yours, uh, Maurice. Uh, uh, one of the things that uh, brought me uh, to the presentation on, on Black American Muslims, and particularly that culture in the United States, and uh, when we look at the dynamics of this particular thing, and then your mention of the Nation of Islam and the mention of Malcolm X, I found myself having a flashback to a question I mentioned with Dr. Parr's presentation as you did last uh, uh, Saturday. And one of the things that I think is very important that people understand is that one of the things that caused Malcolm X to be ostracized from the community was his strong stance on gender in the black American community. Because later on, as he started, and as you know, you know the story, Maurice, but later on, as he is ostracized, he is calling out various indiscretions that are happening with the nation of Islam. He is addressing the issues of black American women. As a matter of fact, if you Google Malcolm X, he, uh, there's a quote that he has that says, the most disrespected person in the United States is the black woman. Okay. Not only that, but in addition to his exploration of looking at Islam outside of the nation of Islam, he did come to Egypt, but what people don't know, he also came to South Sudan. Okay, and not only when he came to South Sudan, he looked at the Cholo. He, I mean, he lived with these people, the Dinka, the Nwa, the Cholo, and they gave him the nickname Red Rooster because of his hair. And many South Sudanese people, especially the elders, still remember those moments to those days because he came many times. So my question, I wanted to point to you. Uh, uh, Marcus, is in your work and in your current work, and I look forward to seeing more of your work because it's so exciting. Is uh, have you gotten around to looking at particularly, aside from the one woman that you did mention, but those Black American women in in North Carolina in that category group, to interview them about their context of gender, their experiences of 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 how they felt that their, their religious belief connected to black American woman identity and womanhood. Because I was um, also, uh, you know, though I'm not Muslim, I was reared and mentored by a lot of Muslim professors <laughs> back in the States. And the woman who trained me as a birth deal was a black American Muslim woman. And so uh, I wondered, and the, the commonality I noticed is many of them also came out of the black church. Okay, so I wanted to ask that question. Have there been any questions that have arrived in how these particular category of black American women, Muslim women, have seen how their religious belief has somehow created a new color to this whole thing of black American experience and rally in North Carolina? If you can touch on that a little bit, if you have, or if not, uh, what are your hopes of pursuing it? What? Out of the, the six interviews uh, that I've gotten so far, um, I've gotten um, two, two black women, uh, Muslim, uh, from, the, from the community. The first was uh, Margaret Muhammad. Uh, she was the founder and, um, and the, the widow of uh, King Muhammad and her daughter, uh, Dr. Ronda Muhammad. Um, and uh, they see themselves a lot 
mostly as uh, educators. Um, they, they had a very um, um, impactful role in the, in the community. So um, um, uh, Margaret Muhammad, she was a business person and an accountant. Uh, in fact, I believe she had more education than her husband. Uh, so she actually um, did a lot of the um, uh, sort of entrepreneurial work uh, for the community uh, in, the, in the early days, and uh, she helped kind of you know balance the books and things like that. Uh, and then Dr. Uh, Ronald Muhammad, her, her daughter, uh, who also has more education than her husband, uh, <laughs> um, she's an educator. Um, uh, she worked for the state. Uh, I can't remember exactly what her job title was, but um, and, and, and also her mother has a school which is kind of. Uh, um, off of the <coughs> off of the the, the, the sister Clara Muhammad schools, and uh, which is very um, interesting uh, thing that, that might be worthy uh, exploration, I think, in the United States because they were that that school system uh, was, you know, was an um, Islamic uh, school system, and they were probably one of the first to actually advocate for um, like homeschooling. Um, they made a, a very strong role in um, uh, alternative education, so to speak, uh, in the United States. That is uh, sort of now more of a liberal thing to do. Um, but um, yeah, <coughs> um, I'm trying to think of the, are there any other uh, aspects I can think of. But, well, there, there are some people I get to interview. Um, there's uh, a few people one that, uh, one is a major, kind of a matriarch of the sort of um, um, the black Sunni Muslim community, uh, and she has a dance company um, where she she does uh, African dance. She's taught generations of uh, African dance and uh, African dance, um, and uh, she's kind of off of the sort of the, um, what I mentioned in my paper, sort of anti-establishment Muslims are people who, who sort of follow the Route of Malcolm X, and uh, they were uh, involved in the sort of revolutionary movement of the 1970s. Uh, uh, I'm to <laughs> uh, there's a lot more that I need to actually sort of capture uh, in my interview. So, uh, no, this answers my question. Thank you. Any other uh, questions? Uh, for um, I have just one for you since we're still on this. Okay. Did you find any common thread? In, in the six interviews that you had, was there something that stood out that was common to each of them? Mm -hmm. Experience, uh, thoughts? <coughs> yeah, yes, so uh, a, lot, a lot of them I tried to sort of mention um, in my paper without sort of, uh, <laughs> so, so basically a lot of the things that, that I mentioned um, that have to do with the activism, um, uh, sort of the, the religious, Ideology or the, um, the organizational philosophy at the time. Uh, a lot of the people that spoke on that, um, and I, I mentioned the, the transition from the nation of Islam to, to uh, sort of orthodox understanding of, of Islam. Um, and a lot of people talked about the, that shift. Um, and then also arts and culture. Uh, the jazz culture was very really big. Uh, in fact, the jazz culture in the United States is always very, uh, is always and sort of integrated with the Muslim, um, with the African American Muslim uh, experience, um, even going back to the 30s. Um, and then there's um, there's a book by uh, Robert Denning called uh, uh, Black Pilgrimage to Islam, where he sort of uh, talks about that. Uh, although I think the area needs a lot more uh, exploration. And then um, uh, sort of education, the, the, the educational uh, aspect of it. Um, um, since they did have a school, a full-time school at one point, and, um, and then uh, just what Durham was like prior to 1980, uh, a lot of people mentioned uh, you know, the different ideas that were going around and uh, how it was so open um, and a lot of people, they didn't have these boundaries of sort of religion and, uh, you know, they, they, the boundaries were there, but they could still sort of associate. It's not like it is now where people are cliquish and sort of don't associate with people that, that don't click the way they do.
Any other questions? Uh, I have a question for Dr. Ward. Uh, uh, it's about the gypsies. Uh, are we accepting them now? Because some works, uh, I guess last year, uh, a series came out, it was a Lebanese Egyptian uh, uh, series, where they showed the gypsy uh, falling in love with the normal man and they started getting what? like a uh, no. normal. <laughs> They started getting their problem, their problems and stuff like that. So are we started to accept them more, seeing their problems, uh, or is that just for the drama? I don't know. I could at first say, well, just in your answer, <laughs> <laughs> there is a response, you know, and, and it's interesting because um, I think they will, and, and it's very similar to Europe, and it's very fascinating about gypsies in general. They, they are always a little bit different. Uh, and, but sometimes they are different in a positive and sometimes in a negative way. So they are like criminals that are negative. Oh, they are sort of like exotic in them. So that's positive. But they are still not normal. Yeah. So, so that's why maybe the stereotype is not as vicious and saying they are horrible. But it's still like us versus them that is still a little bit present. Um, and so I think there will always be... The other thing about a lot of them is they are... Uh, not only are they seen as like different than gypsies and coming from whatever different track, they're also extremely poor. So there's also the stigma that poverty has. Uh, and so, uh, and they are, they are seen as like, you, you know, sort of an underclass and, and a problematic underclass still. So I think perhaps having more movies and knowing more about them can be something that helps, but I think it will, it will be very difficult to totally uh, get rid of, of the stigma. Uh, that is a stigma on people in general that are seen as a little bit different. Yeah. As soon as there is difference, there is always these boundaries that I was talking about. So, you know, it can be more or less aggressive and violent, but there, as long as they are different, that can be a little problematic. Um, that actually fits into my question in many ways. Um, I am linking the music here, the jazz and the chitana from the flamenco yeah. because of course in Spain the flamenco is very beautiful mm -hmm. in many ways and it's more the positive gypsy <coughs> culture. Yeah. yeah? And in the you France, know, for example, the the, 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 the romance, it's really bad. Yeah. And they're always discriminated against. But I think it's because probably um, I, I don't think I mean I'm asking you. Is it because of the 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 gypsy being adopted, as it were, by people like Garcia Lorca, mm -hmm. who really immortalized them, and Emily May, and mm -hmm. all this literature that came from, you know, um, glorifying, in a way, mm -hmm. the Gitano culture, the flamenco slash gypsy culture, and then people like Liszt, who had his Hungarian dances. So through music, there is, <laughs> there is great acceptance and recognition. You know, even in, sorry, going a bit further, like the, the Maghreban culture in France, you know, they gained acceptance through music, through the guy, mm -hmm. which is actually the Arabic word, gay, which means, you know, Ahmed de Mer. <laughs> you know, he's, he's, he's stoned, I guess, but in a good way. Right. Um, so so I, I think, do you want to say something mm -hmm. about jazz? So, uh, I think it's really interesting that the story of flamenco, and there's been a little bit of research on that. How flamenco, uh, and maybe you can think about blues or jazz, was really the, the music and the art of the suffering of, yes. of the, the gypsies in Spain, the Gitanos, yes. you know? Uh, but there's been a cultural appropriation of flamenco in ah. Spain. Yeah. Uh, because, so first of all, it was really the music of the, the gypsies who were not accepted, not integrated, and they, they were, would the refugee, you know, they would go in, in the flamenco. And then, yes, especially, the, the, it was the Quranic. It was again not Islam because you know flamenco's music, the way they sing is Muslim. Mm -hmm. It's the Muazzin. Yeah. Even, even so, the so there is a lot of different <coughs> things. But it was really a, a, the, 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 the art of the suffering. And then it became, again in the 19th century, uh, appropriated by the state as this is Spain. And especially mm -hmm. because we think about Orientalism, it pleased the 
European travelers from Britain and from France because they thought it was sort of like a little bit, you know, Arabic, Arabesque. Yeah. Exactly. And so suddenly flamenco is not the music or the dance of the suffering people, but it's the dance of the Spain. essential dance of Spain that we can uh, commodity, as a commodity that we can sell commodities. Yeah. So commodify. So I think that's really interesting. So does it mean that they are more integrated or does it mean that they are being abused? Uh, is, is what we can ask. Mm -hmm. uh, and definitely, I mean, in Spain, and I think Spanish people would like praise themselves and say, oh yeah, we really accept the Gitanos. But if you look at the communities, I mean, they are not fully accepted and there's a lot of poverty and there's a lot of stigma. And there is a difference between the South, I mean, the South I'm from Andalusia, yeah. that is different from being from Spain. Mm -hmm. but yeah, there is also regional differences, yeah. absolutely, mm -hmm. between like Southern uh, Spaniards mm -hmm. and, and others. So it's, it's interesting, you know, one word, and then Lauren, you, but in Egypt as well, there's a lot of uh, gypsy music. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and so a lot of people will say, oh, gypsy music, great, and, and so forth. There's a central cultural center, actually, it's called Makan. Oh, yes. Uh, yes. And they have uh, gypsies, uh, Hagar, uh, playing there. So if you're interested, you can go and, and, uh, and see that. But it's funny because I interviewed uh, some people there, and they, they really said it's gypsy music and I said well, but who are the gypsies and they were not really sure. <laughs> so there is also a, a bit of a sort of a separation between the identity and the art and sometimes people like the art and they take the art but yeah. they follow who is behind like it. They forget who is behind the art. I'm with you. <coughs> and he's got the song and it's appropriate as well. Yeah. Uh, you know uh, actually as you're talking uh, an idea came to mind. Uh, um, I was wondering if well and just kind of connecting it with my paper, mm -hmm. um, because the, the person who was considered the founder of uh, the Nation of Islam, he came from the East. And some people say that he was Turkish, some people say he was Indian or something like that. But he was very mysterious and he was sort of a wanderer, he uh, sold vacuum or something like that, door to door. And uh, I wonder if <laughs> there's a connection there. <laughs> Maybe your next research. <laughs> Mike, well, it's actually Mr. Uh, Wilson. This is a question, but I want to go back to uh, you mentioned a point. Uh, because when you mentioned about the, the gypsies and how it seems that in the arenas of music and dance are where women can actually have showcased that power and be acceptable and celebrated. Uh, I mean, I see that in the same thing with jazz, with blues with rap time, when you talk about, you know, the Empress of Blues, Queen uh, Bessie Smith, not out, well, yeah, but I'm um, particularly with blues with uh, Bessie Smith, uh, and uh, just looking at how, you know, in, in these sectors, it, that is actually becoming acceptable, they're the singer or the dancer, uh, and so forth. Um, so I guess when you mentioned, would be the narrative, Dr. Parks, about, um, uh, you know, how it's coming, you know, uh, from a place of pain to marginalization and then it being adopted by the state. I and mean, then we have an example of that with American music. Now jazz is considered American music where jazz calls are internationally, but it is the black American music and culture, you know, uh, and coming from blues and coming from the plantation, even having its origins in gospel in the black church. And, but, but that's why I find it very interesting where it's about black Muslim culture because I notice in every case, and you can correct me if I'm wrong on this, but they still have that connection to the black children somehow. They haven't left that, that particular thing. They still somewhat keep that connected to their, to their Muslim tradition, which now, since I touched on that, let me go to Mr. Salfrey and my question about uh, forgiveness. Uh, when we talk about the philosophy of forgiveness, and it, in a way, liberating the person who has been hurt from the bond. Does that mean that, because I often hear, you know, my mother and my grandmothers would tell me that, you know, you forgive people not for them but for you, you know, so that you, so are we then saying that once I forgive, in a way, that's the greatest revenge, I don't want to say revenge, but, but, well, we can say that. <laughs> the, the revenge, because I'm no longer connected to that bond, and does that then mean that the person who has not reconciled, their punishment, we can say, if they have not reconciled, don't go on is to stay in that bond by themselves? If you could correct me or, or talk to me about that. I think it's a, it's, it's a, difficult, it's a difficult question. Uh, 
I want to argue that forgiveness always aims at reconciliation. Um, it's hard for me to think of someone who has forgiven another, but still holds him in a place where if that other does a sort of repentance, which to me means um, accepts the fact that he has wronged and does not want to continue in this wrong in some sort, if I put repentance and forgiveness together somehow, uh, it would be very strange to say I've forgiven you, but I still hold you in a place where I don't want you at all. Um, that would, for me, put a question mark on what forgiveness means. Now, I understand that there is something that we can do to kind of get out of the bitterness of the thing that, that has happened to us. And I, I hear this language of we forgive for ourselves. And there's actually there's a philosopher who would argue that the idea of asking a person to repent and in order for me to forgive them is a way of punishing that person. It's a way of kind of putting the ranks back in their place. Because the main problem with, uh, with, with, with hurt is a status issue. You know, when someone hurts me, my status is lowered, so if the person repents, my status is back up. And I don't want to, I don't think I want to think of it that way. But if I think of it as uh, forgiveness being a power that the, the, the hurt person has um, to liberate themselves, but also to liberate the person who is hurt them. Because it is the necessary condition for that person to be liberated from their guilt. Um, so I, I would say that forgiveness, in the way I understand it, is an act and a process that will aim at reconciliation even if it doesn't attain it. Because part of it is in the, in the hands of the person who has injured. So that helps you. Okay. So, uh, I guess we can. That was one minute. <laughs> thank you all for sharing and uh, thank you all for coming. Hope this is not broadcasting on uh, national television or something. <laughs> uh, yeah, thank you all for coming. Thank you. Uh, thank you. <laughs>